On this episode of UTR, we're back in Grand Rapids with more compelling content for you to consider. We'll show you a creamy koozie concoction, a totally 70s situation room, and some enormous art. Heck, we'll even take you on a righteously quiet ride. Get ready to explore the cool people, places, and things that make Grand Rapids a great place to be. What if the world is a blank canvas and our imagination the brush? We would use only the most vibrant colors, the most dramatic strokes, creating a world of endless expression and endless possibilities. Creating a world like Grand Rapids, where every day is a work of art and the inspiration is pure Michigan. Your trip begins at Michigan.org. There's something special about the pride, the skill, and the passion it takes to build something great. The Construction Association of Michigan, CAM, understands that passion and has been providing contractors with the resources they need since 1885. A visit to the Stahls Automotive Museum will take you back to a time when cars were more than just a way to get around. In addition to beautiful cars, enjoy the collection of gas pumps, road signs, oil cans, and other car-related accessories. Info at stallsauto.com. DestinationAnnArbor.org is your gateway to Chelsea, Dexter, Manchester, Milan, Celine, Ypsilanti, and Ann Arbor. Find out the best spots to eat, festivals to attend, activities to do, and places to discover at DestinationAnnArbor.org. I've been around the world, but there's one place I keep coming back to. And the more I explore, the more I realize it's the place to be. I'm Tom Dalton, and this is Under the Radar, Michigan. You know, of all the grand cities we go to in Michigan, there's one we keep coming back to over and over and over again. But for good reason. Actually, for a ton of good reasons. That's right, over the past decade, we've given you a lot of reasons to visit this great town. But if you feel the need for more, get out your bucket and add to the list, because Grand Rapids has it all. This is a major metropolitan city that's the size you can totally wrap your walk around. And if you watched our show, you know that there's no better place for great food, fun, shopping, architecture, history, art, and that's right, beer. Because Grand Rapids was designated Beer City USA. And somewhere here, they're making a brew just for you. This really is a great place to live, work, play, and young or old, make your mark. And speaking of mark, here's where you can mark it on your virtual map. Grand Rapids is conveniently located right where we left it the last time we were here, in southwest central lower Michigan, or something like that. You know, sometimes simple things are the best, and when it comes to peanut butter, the Koozie Company has been packing peanutty perfection for almost a century now. Whoa, that's a lot of peanuts. You heard right. Four generations of Koozies have been spreading not only their peanut butter, but their sweet confections and salty selections across all of Michigan and now the world. What's the secret to all their success? Easy, they keep it simple, natural, and in the vernacular of the last century, old timey. Now their award-winning peanut butter goes by the name of Cream Nut. And the name of the current koozie in command of this family-owned company? Well, he goes by the name of Jeff. Now Jeff, I don't usually ask, but I hope you don't mind, I hear your peanut butter is so good, <laughs> I want the recipe. Okay, the recipe is yeah. peanuts. Peanuts. Roast them. Roast them. Grind them. Grind them. Add salt. Salt. That's it. That's it? That's it. Why is it so That's good? Because uh, we've been doing it since 1925. So we got <laughs> we figured it out last year. How did, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, we're still trying to figure this out. How did your family get in the peanut butter making business? So back in the day, like the teens, Every little town in the United States basically had a little peanut butter company because you could move the peanuts, but you couldn't. There was no distribution for the finished products. Oh, so you made it for your neighborhood. So you opinion. made it, yeah, yeah. So there were two or three of them in, in this town, and so in 1925 or so, my grandfather bought one that was called the Bell Carmo Peanut Butter Company because we had been in kind of the produce business before that, and then he bought another one in the 30s during the Depression. Well, the name Koozie is you were saying it's, it's Dutch. It's Dutch. Yeah. It's so Dutch. he came over from the land of Dutch. 
the land of Dutch, <laughs> and, yes. and started yeah, doing right, that here. Right, right. And you're the fourth generation. Fourth generation. So my great grandfather was an immigrant. He came here about 1898. Yeah. Now I noticed back there a lot of the machines. I think your grandfather would be right at home here because a lot of the machines you use are still from that era. Yeah, they are. They're from the 40s, I want to say, probably 40s, early 50s. So, and the manufacturing has changed a lot. And we actually bought that equipment to make this style of peanut butter again because it had kind of gotten out of fashion a little bit, and we kind of wanted to bring it back. So we had to get the old equipment, which was a little bit of an Easter egg hunt. Well, a lot of the places we go that have the old, old equipment, it's like, it's that old rule, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And a lot of that stuff lasts forever, and it makes the best quality product. That's exactly right. Well, you guys used to be a little neighborhood peanut butter company, but you've kind of, I mean, I don't know if it's through word of mouth or whatever, but you guys ship around the world now, don't you? We do. So our biggest market is still probably Michigan, around that area, but our second biggest market is probably England. Um, really? And that's because there's a couple of shows, and foreign buyers are very interested in U.S. products, and particularly ones that have a heritage and a story. Now, you guys branched out from peanut butter, too. You guys do all kinds of confections. You even have colossal, I guess they're called colossal cashews. Are they the kind that if they escape, they'll destroy New York City? Are they not that quite, big? Not quite that big. Oh, no, they're, not, no. okay, they're not that big. <laughs> but yeah, you guys do yeah. all kinds of confections. Yeah, so, well, so my grandfather, after he bought the peanut business, he had roasting equipment. Yeah. So then he branched out into nut roasting of tree nuts, so almonds, cashews, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that business sort of morphed over the years into a holiday gift business. So, you know, we sell year round, but the biggest part of that is giving for mainly Christmas, Thanksgiving. My birthday's, but, my birthday's coming birthdays, up. Your birthday, Easter's, Easter just was, Mother's Day coming. But yeah. so that, that kind of grew in that direction. And then my dad actually started the chocolate business. Well, it's great to buy from people like you because you're in the neighborhood, you're part of the community. It kind of means, it's nice to, to buy your stuff from people that you kind of know and you can get to know, you know? So it's just, your story's perfect for us because that's what we look for. It's been a changing landscape. I'm not exactly sure how we managed to hang on for 109 years, but. Because you're doing something yeah. right, that's why, exactly. <laughs> it's funny because I always joke, I want to leave the TV show to my kids, they want nothing to do with it. <laughs> but it, it must mean a lot to be a fourth generation and to carry on a family legacy and a tradition like that, doesn't it? Yeah, no, it's been really, it's been really a terrific thing for the family. And to, to be in the community and have people come in, you know, oh, I, used, I knew your grandfather, I knew your dad. I worked with so-and-so, you know, and hear those stories and have people come back. Well, do all of us a big favor and don't change the recipe. As complicated, as, complicated as it is, as it is don't change the recipe. Do it. Yeah, because yeah. the, the peanut butter's great, your candies well, are great. And, and I was teasing about that. I mean, it is simple, but there's, there's a fair amount of subtlety having to do with the kind of peanut and the quality of the peanut and how the peanut's handled, how it's roasted. So I don't think you could do it, even with my expert guidance. <laughs> I know I, if, if, you knew, if you knew me any better. If you, I knew you, it yeah, would be. Yeah, I could not do yeah, it, no. It would be possible. Well, as the koozies have proven year after year after year, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if I were you, I'd fix myself a peanut butter sandwich with some cream nut real soon. Because when you bite into it, you'll actually taste three ingredients, peanuts, salt, and a huge helping of family pride. It's something we have a lot of here in Michigan. You know, I'll be honest, I'm a total survivor of the 70s. It's the decade that defined me. Long hair, loud music, crazy clothes, TV dinners. Oh wait, was that the 60s or the 80s? I think I'm having my first flashback. Oh look, my favorite TV show's on. <laughs> well, whether you lived it or missed it, if your time machine's in the shop, here's a place where you can slide back to the 70s in style. The Commons Restaurant and Lounge is a funky, cool blast from the past that serves up fantastic food, classic cocktails, and a decor featuring my favorite decade. It's tucked away on the bottom floor of the Oakwood Manor Apartments on Cherry Street, which is exactly where you'd expect to find a 70s rec room. Beth Rich is the restaurateur and time traveler who came back home from California to open this groovy gastronomical gathering place. And when she's not shopping for more memorabilia, you'll find her right here at the Commons. Okay, first things first. How did you get my mother's rec room in your restaurant? I love that. That's exactly what you're supposed to feel like when you're here. Oh my gosh, everything from the wood paneling to the lamps 
Did you go to Lost and Found? We featured them here in town. I did. I you spent did. a lot of time with Mark at Lost and Found. Yep. It's yep. called what? Lost and Found Treasures Old and old New? Old and New, yeah. Great yeah, place. Like, yeah, yeah, that's where a lot of this came from. Another neat thing is it's in kind of the basement or ground floor of an apartment building, so it's exactly it where our rec... Basement. Yeah, it's exactly where this should be. It's exactly. perfect. What inspired you to do this? Well, a bunch of things. So yeah, the 70s were my era. This Not does look too. an awful lot like my parents' house, mixed with my grandparents, because there's more than one era kind of represented. But um, yeah, you know, I wanted it to feel like home, and I wanted to do something a little different. I, I learned how to do this in Los Angeles where it's about the whole experience. It's not just about the food or the decor, it's about the whole thing. I've always said that about good restaurants. Mm -hmm. It's service, food, and then it's the experience, it's the ambiance, it's the atmosphere, it's the decor. And you nailed it. I Thank mean, you. oh my gosh. And the food here, you guys actually don't serve TV dinners, do you? You know, we don't, <laughs> but we're talking about getting closer to that for the summer just because we're ready to tweak the menu a little bit. We tried to do some things that are a little retro and not seen everywhere, but you know, you also want to have things that people are eating today. Yeah. When we did the research, we ate so differently back in the 70s, and the drinks were so different as well. Yeah. So we took some old standards and kind of made them a little more current. Well, I remember in the 70s, I was having Tom Collins. I thought that right? was, I was all grown up because I had a Tom <laughs> Collins. I have no idea what was in it, but um, so there's no Salisbury steak. No, nope. <laughs> nothing, nope, no jello, no ambrosia salad, nothing like that. What do young people say when they come in here? Well, it's funny. So the people in my contemporaries remember it all, but the young people just think it's cool. Oh, they still think, they it's, they think it's cool? They think it's cool, yeah. And, they're, and, and they may be bringing some of this stuff back. They are, they're liking it enough to start seeking some of it out, yeah. which most of us don't. I mean, I love it here, but I don't know if I want that lamp in my house. And I was, we, were just saying right? that, we were just saying that a minute ago, that this lamp is wonderfully hideous. Wonderful. It's really ugly, but it's beautiful here. How has the community embraced what you're doing? They've been great. The reception's been so good. We're humbled and thrilled, so grateful. They think it's unique, but the menu's accessible enough that you can come every day. It's not just a, you know, once a year, it's a unique experience kind yeah. of thing. So yeah, they've been awesome. The neighbors in this actual neighborhood walk and come for lunch, and we do have parking, so we get a lot of people who drive to see us too, so it's been great. And you're right, it's so great to be able to either live upstairs from here or just live down the street and walk down to a little place like this. Your little pub. Yeah, your own little pub yep. that reminds you of your rec room when you were Exactly. <laughs> well, Marsha Brady called. She wants her sofa back. She wants her sofa. <laughs> so if you're finding the current decade to be a bit stressful and you'd like to sample a slice of the 70s, come chow and chill at the Commons. Because after a great meal and a couple of cocktails, it's all just a stone cold gas, baby. Oh, and who knows? You might even run into a 70s celebrity or two. Well, it happened. I stayed at the Commons so long, I actually became Magnum P.I. Well, minus the muscles and the hair and the good looks and the dimple, the short shorts. <laughs> oh. hey, hello. Oh, hey, Higgins. Yeah, I'll bring the car back. Yes, I'll gas it up. Do you ever start doodling with a pencil and get carried away? Well, here's a guy that started doodling and got so carried away, he turned it into an incredible career. And uh, his pencils don't even have erasers. Meet Chris Laporte, a college professor by day and doodler by night. When he was small, he started small. But as his talent grew, so did his drawings. Chris's colossal pencil portraits are displayed all over Grand Rapids. And if you see one, it'll completely stop you in your tracks. His attention to detail will grab more than just your attention. It'll grab your imagination, intellect, and soul. So just how do these enormous lifelike creations come to be? Well, sounds like a great question for the artist himself. The first time I was exposed to your work, we were actually featuring Art Prize, which is a huge international art competition here in Grand Rapids. And we went into their offices and they said, oh, last year's winner is on display. You should go look at it. And I went in and the first thing I saw was a wall of people staring at a wall. And then I looked and it's called Cavalry, correct? Right. And it's this humongous drawing of a cavalry. Yeah. So lifelike that it was almost surreal to see the people looking at the people looking back at the people. Yeah. Where did you get the inspiration for that? And how long did it take Well, you? <laughs> I mean, it took a while to make that drawing, about nine months. And it took, you know, a lot longer beforehand to work up to a place where I could attempt something like that. 
Explain the process you go through making one of these colossal drawings. Well, before I studied art, I was actually a civil engineering student. So uh, there's a lot of math involved. If you check out the margins, you can find little equations of how things might fit or where things might go. Oh, so you don't just start on one side no. and head for the other and hope it works out? No, um, you come up with a game plan. Yeah. So I do a lot of studies and trial runs, and especially the portraits, I'll do individual portrait studies because when you take a source, which is maybe a thumbnail big, and then you make that life size, what was a detail is now vague. So therein lies the challenge, but also the opportunity to kind of try and round out uh, not just a person, but a character with thoughts, emotions, a history. And I get to try and discover that and at the same time reveal that. And the neat thing is you put part of your personality, history, family into some of these photographs. And that's why when you actually go in and study the stuff that you do, there's other layers of curtains that open up for you. Process yields content. How you make the thing will end up actually being what it's about. So the technical and aesthetic choices that I made to use a really dense pencil to really, you know, to sense the labor that goes into it, you know, that the drawing of the band took a year of my life. So that's, like you said, it's in there and the investment of that. not so much to impress people, but to impress upon people that it's not just a snapshot, that there's so much before and so much after, and making these life-size so that they're, like when you said when you walked in to um, the Art Prize hub, yes. people yeah. looking at people, looking at people, then uh, there's the opportunity for more um, of a present dialogue versus, oh, that was, that was then. Right. You know, no, no, this is now. And try to breathe life into them. The limitations of photography at the time with the long exposure, you know, they're often really plain or stern. I get the opportunity to turn a smirk or furrow a brow or a, a combination of things that might reveal or allude to a three-dimensional person with ideas or feelings about what their experience is. Could I get you to commission a, a, a life-size or perhaps larger-than-life drawing of me? Absolutely. I, in fact, I, I already started on one. Really? Yeah. You're going to need a number three pencil, <laughs> actually, and a large eraser. <laughs> now, some people say that bigger is better. Well, that may not always be true, but in this case, I agree. Because of their sheer size, these drawings completely consume you, and they look back at you in a way that totally takes you back in time. Now, next time you're in Grand Rapids, find one of Chris Laporte's masterpieces, and I guarantee you'll see a part of history that'll become part of your history. You know, cycling is something we should all do more of. It's a great way to get around, it's really good for you, and it lessens your carbon footprint. Ah, but how could you make it better? <laughs> Easy. Just add a third wheel. We've already got one, though. It's me. Well, that's exactly what they did here at Terra Trike. They added a wheel, perfected the process, and made a bike, or should I say trike, that totally changes your riding experience. And they did it right here in Grand Rapids. I met up with Mark Cruz in their shop so he could give me the who, what, when, where, why, and how they did it. Is it true that this whole company started at a party on a napkin? <laughs> yeah, Seriously? yeah, it is, yeah. So the two owners knew each other uh, in Hastings. They went to school a couple grades apart, but families got together for a Christmas party, and uh, there they were, and Jack said, hey, Wayne, you think we could make this and sketch it out on a napkin, and there you go. The and rest off, is history, yeah. And off they went. Yeah. You, know, you know, I've watched people on recumbent bikes and always wondered what the experience was really like, but you guys went, from this little napkin at a party to you're now the number one seller of trikes in the United States? Yeah, recumbent trikes in the U.S., that is what we are known for, and that's what we do well. The experience, well, you're going to find out here shortly, right? Yeah, I understand. Um, you have something in store. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
but yeah, we're, we're, we've got 250 dealers across the U.S. We do sell direct, and out of those 250 dealers, 300 stores total. So, you know, they're out there, and you can find them. And we really encourage dealers to do test rides because that's how you understand what it's about and what it's like. What intrigues me about because I've never been on one before, and you'll you'll notice you'll see that when I get on, but. Uh, the fact that I, I, do, I'm a, I do a ton of mountain biking, mm -hmm. I'm an avid biker, I have been all my whole life, um, is you don't, I, I'm, I'm curious what it's like to actually not be hunched over looking at the ground, right. be able to sit back and look around you as you're riding. That's why people come to these tracks, not just the medical benefits, you know, if you've had a stroke or whatever, you don't have to balance on this, there's a lot of those, but a lot of people that don't have those ailments don't realize how much more comfortable this is. Yeah. I mean, you're on your, we say it's the world's fastest lawn chair. <laughs> I mean, if, you, if you sit back and drink your coffee and, yeah. and enjoy the scenery, watch the wildlife. We have so many rail to trails in Michigan here. This is perfect for it. So the comforts there. Not to mention um, that part of your anatomy that shall remain nameless <laughs> that can, is, is, yeah. can. No I could, pressure could, points here. Yeah, could use a little <laughs> less stress sometimes. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, the benefits seem wonderful. Yeah. I've just never tried it yeah, for exactly. some reason. So what kind of people gravitate towards a recumbent trike? Anybody that wants to be more comfortable, uh -huh. really. What you just described, sometimes they're avid riders. Sometimes they're people that haven't ridden since they were a kid because a normal bike's not comfortable for them. Right. You've got the little wedgie seat, we call it, the pressure on the handlebars like that in your hands. This takes all of that away. Again, if you're comfortable sitting there like that, you can do this. Well, like you said, those little wedgie seats, hence the stress. Right, <laughs> the, right. So yeah, and the fact that you can't fall down. I mean, yeah. my knee still hurts because I fell down just 10 days ago. Right. I, I was. I thought, the weather's great again. I can go Let's out. Go. Yay, ah, boom, I went down. So. Yeah. So yeah, the fact that you can, like you said, you can There's sit There's no your... learning curve to these. You hop on well, and go. You haven't seen your try, try and ride <laughs> we'll yet. We'll find out. Yeah, we'll find out. Well, with about three inches of rain in the forecast, Mark decided to take me on a ride on their official test track, AKA, we did some lunchtime laps in the warehouse. You know, Mark, the first thing, well, first of all, I love your test track. And we, we dodge all the boxes in your warehouse. <laughs> but this actually works as a test track. Oh, yeah. This is where we uh, test all the trikes before they go out, yeah. direct to a consumer, and we play around and do laps for uh, the prototypes. Well, the first thing I notice about being on this bike is how much higher I'm sitting than I thought I would be. Well, one of the claim to fames that we have is the higher seat, easier to get in and out of. Yeah. And. We just kind of changed the, the face of the recumbent industry by doing that. Plus, it's extremely comfortable. Oh my gosh. And that part of my anatomy that shall remain nameless we discussed earlier right. is just happy as can be. I mean, this is just <laughs> wonderful. Like you said, and I doubted you, that the learning curve was going to be simple. And even yeah. for me, the learning curve was, I mean, I've only been on the bike for five minutes, and this is amazing. Amazingly comfortable, amazingly easy. If you get a bike like this, you're, it's good for you. It's a great way to get around. It lessens your carbon footprint. Yep. Um, and it's fun. And you may have just sold me a bike. <laughs> <laughs> we can load it up. <laughs> so if you're tired of looking down all the time and getting sore in the saddle in that sensitive area, <clears throat> so to speak, take a righteous ride on a Terra trike. You'll never know how much you like it till you, well, try it and like it. And the same thing goes for Grand Rapids. Until you spend some quality time here, you'll never know how much you like it. Like I always say, you never know until you go. So go ahead and go and then you'll know. <laughs> Can you tell I just made that up? Hey there, want to know more about all the great places we go on the program? Just go to our website. You can watch episodes, tell us where to go, jump to our Facebook page, and even buy a hat like mine. So just go to utrmichigan.com. That's utrmichigan.com. Go now. Or now. What if the world is a blank canvas and our imagination the brush? We would use only the most vibrant colors, the most dramatic strokes, creating a world of endless expression and endless possibilities, creating a world like Grand Rapids, where every day is a work of art, and the inspiration is pure Michigan. Your trip begins at Michigan.org.
There's something special about the pride, the skill, and the passion it takes to build something great. The Construction Association of Michigan, CAM, understands that passion and has been providing contractors with the resources they need since 1885. A visit to the Stahls Automotive Museum will take you back to a time when cars were more than just a way to get around. In addition to beautiful cars, enjoy the collection of gas pumps, road signs, oil cans, and other car-related accessories. Info at stallsauto.com. Support provided by DestinationAnnArbor.org. Your gateway to Chelsea, Dexter, Manchester, Milan, Celine, Ypsilanti, and Ann Arbor.